This is a production of Cornell University. Okay. So thank you. It's really nice honor to be back here. Uh, especially nice honor to be invited by the graduate students. Uh, that's a great honor. So it was almost just shy of eight years ago I had my defense right in this room. So. <laughs> so for all you grad students, in just a few years from now, you could have a bunch of children running around a home and a bunch of grad students running around the lab. <laughs> and you could be back here. Okay? And uh, so also I need to dedicate this to like Rebecca and Ed for the inspiration to work on high throughput phenotyping. Uh, we had this great idea to work on the maize nam populations uh, for disease resistance, right? So I literally calculated up, I literally spent like one and a half month of my life um, looking at maize lesions and recording percentage disease leaf area for thousands of plots over and over and over again. So it gives you a lot of inspiration to do something more efficiently than walking around the field. <laughs> So, um, so thanks. <laughs> okay, so I always put everything in the context of uh, where we need to be in the next couple of decades. So we projected 60% increase in demand for wheat. Uh, if we leave everything with climate change, hotter climates, you'll push that down 20%. So we need about a 2% gain per year. And current, currently wheat, wheat is at, most major crops are at about a 1% uh, gain per year. So in the context of the breeding cycle, um, is there any way to like make the little thing go? Who knows? This thing is stuck at the top? OK, whatever. Um, so in the context of the breeding cycle, we're trying to make this cycle go faster and more efficient. So we're making crosses. You know, early stages, you're evaluating for diseases. Uh, later stages, you evaluate for yield. And then really late on, you uh, look at quality. You pick the best performing stuff. And then you advance to the next cycle. So we really work in this, this mindset, this mantra of if we can make the breeding cycle go bigger and faster, uh, then we can uh, lead to more, more rapid improved varieties. So that's why we work a lot on genomic selection. We work a lot on high throughput uh, phenotyping. And so in this context, <coughs> the genetic gain over the time is a function of the selection intensity so that you know we need bigger populations. It's a diminishing returns, but that's a lot of focus on the high throughput phenotyping and the genomic selection can help with um, with bigger populations, the selection accuracy, this is some high throughput phenotyping. We can make more accurate measurements than you can do by hand. Um, the genetic variance, we work a lot on genetic diversity. Won't, won't really touch on that. And then the years per cycle, that's also like a, a one of the components of working on genomic selection. So th this is kind of like putting all the things together. I'm just gonna really focus on some of the things, the fun, the fun new things that we've been doing uh, with genomic selection recently. And so we really have to define like what is high throughput phenotyping. Okay, so here, here's how we define high throughput. It's like gotta be mostly or fully automated data collection. So currently we're almost there, right? You, you like spend like 15 minutes like collecting data and then like 15 months like analyzing it. So it's not really high throughput yet in that sense, but we're, 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 we're almost there. Um, we really define it as we have to be able to do tens of thousands of plots. So we look at the, actual breeding programs, they're operating in the thousands and tens of thousands. So if it's not scalable to that, then it's not really scalable. Uh, we got to do this in the field. We, like I said, we got to have automated data processing and data collection. And then I always note that like high resolution isn't really high throughput. So if there's one thing I learned at Cornell, it's like the power of big populations. So you don't have to measure things real accurately. You just got to measure them on a huge population. Okay. So so really, like, how do we define what is HTP, it says up there. So one thing is the breeders, the benchmark. See, this is Dr. Ravi Singh. He runs the Simit Wheat Program. He can go through in an afternoon 4,000 um, small plots, make really accurate um, uh, selections for height, for disease, for uh, maturity. And so that's your benchmark right, right there. Okay, so this is, he says, uh, HTP is, is high throughput painting, right? So you go through and paint the ones that are good. And that's what gets selected, right? So that's your benchmark right there. Uh, the other one is that breeders are notoriously good, right? So that's the combination here at phenotyping, meaning like just like Robbie does, he makes really nice, accurate selections for height, but nobody records the data. So the point is that if we're going to build prediction models, you actually have to have like data numbers to go into the models and not just like breeders selecting it was kept or not. 
Okay. And then the last one is, like I said, the power of big populations. So we need to be able to like apply these systems on populations that are literally in the tens of thousands. So in the CIMIT program, for example, there's 50,000 new inbred lines generated every year that go into uh, a field plot of some sort. So in connecting the genotype to the phenotype, we do a lot of this. We like observe a phenotype, quantitative genetics, we try and find some correlation uh, back to the genotype. Uh, and then we try and work out the biology of how that, those genes actually turn into the phenotype we observe. And then in breeding, what we really want to do is use the genotype to predict the phenotypes into the next cycle of selection. So in the scope of high throughput phenotyping, what we're really talking about is some phenotype that predicts some other phenotype that's more difficult to measure, okay? So one example that, you know, that I'd like to show is that canopy temperature is real easy to measure. That has, under, under heat or drought stress conditions, that has a really strong negative correlation uh, with yield. Okay, so this is just one example of what we're thinking about in the high throughput phenotyping. So a lot of what we do in the high throughput phenotyping is like direct sensor measurements of something like a vegetation index. And so what you have here is like looking at the ratio of the green to red to near infrared uh, reflectance from that leaf gives you a really nice assessment of the overall health uh, status of that plant, right? Nitrogen status, any disease uh, type of problems. And so we, we've become like, we've been working on this for several years. This is becoming really routine, especially with the UAVs to measure. Uh, literally like this last year, we, we were able to cover the 50,000 uh, unique individual plots at multiple time points on the breeding program. So this is becoming really routine. Uh, we've done this with the ground vehicles. So I, I'll just highlight this here. You know, we started out with this ground vehicle. It's got precision GPS on each side here, a number of sensors. Um, the, you know, we've been working on these type of platforms uh, for several years. You can drive through the field like this. Uh, those sensors are continually collecting data. We can use the GPS to assign those back uh, to individual plots. And so what that looks like then is you can traverse back and forth in the field, each one of those being a single data point. You can take those data points. We, uh, we have different ways to survey out the plot coordinate boundaries and then based on that intersection of the, the plots and the data points, you can assign those to individual plots in the field. So this has become over the last couple of years, like sort of routine, it's becoming very routine. We're also doing it with um, the UAVs. And so here's an example, flying some of these uh, in India. And uh, the nice thing about the UAVs is we've been able to deploy them all over the world so we can pack them up in a suitcase. We put these on you know, the field trials in, in Mexico and in India, all across, we can haul them all across Kansas. And so here's like a false color image of what that looks like with the near infrared band. And so from this, you can very easily crop out the individual plots, get an assessment of NDVI. And then what we've been doing is incorporating those into prediction models. And so here's just an example. The grad students, you can get these papers and then go read them, okay? And uh, then there'll be a quiz. Uh, after the class. And so with that, right, we can take these, we can incorporate them into combined models that have genomic selection combined with the high throughput phenotyping data as like two levels of information onto those, onto those small yield plots and then predicting like yield as if it was a replicated field trial. And so that's really the, that's really the scope of where we're using these as like secondary correlated traits uh, to yield we're becoming very high throughput and efficient in measuring them across huge number of plots. And so now it's just a matter of optimizing the prediction models. So um, that's really where we're at. Um, real brief overview of where we're at with high throughput phenotyping for simple things like vegetation index. And so I didn't want to uh, just highlight that and use that kind of as the, the background uh, context of where we're at for that. So this is like, uh, that, so that's the example, like just the real simple of directly measuring something like plant greenness, okay, and then using that to improve. And we can, we can drastically improve the prediction models with that level of information. So this is an idea of like phenotyping um, from images, just phenotyping flower color, okay? So that's basically what we've been doing. So this is just really simple here, right? If you take this picture and you apply a red filter, uh, you can see that there's a lot of red pixels here and no red pixels here. So we could very easily directly quantify from the sensor measurements, directly from the sensor measurements, 
we can quantify what's the redness uh, of that flower, okay? So that gets us to traits like, you know, how green is the plant, but we really want to get to more, what I see, like complex traits, not in genetic architecture, but just in like the actual physical architecture of those traits. So if you wanted to phenotype actually for flower type, okay, um, what this would look like is you actually have some really complicated function on here that, that you can look at this and say, you know, this is a lily, this is a petunia, um, but with that, you're taking a lot of background knowledge of like what the shape of the flower looks like, what different colors those flowers come in, you know. Um, you know, the one time your significant other gave you some flowers and they were petunias or lilies or your favorite, whatever. Right? Is this some really complicated function to say like what type of flower this is? It takes into account the shape and everything. So this is, this is where we get into like this deep learning of wanting to be able to apply this uh, directly on images to score uh, complex uh, traits in wheat. So this is like the, this is the real simple background. And here again, we got like fabulous computer science collaborators. So um, I'll give you my cursory overview. And I'm not real sure anybody really understands how these work anyway. So uh, we'll just tell you what we know about. So these are convolutional neural networks. You start with some uh, two-dimensional representation. So this has to be like an image that actually has like some spatial representation of something. And then they're put through these convolutions until you actually get linear um, mapping of the pixels into some function. Okay. So if the relationship we want is sufficiently complicated, meaning it's like some plant morphology, uh, there's not really a linear function that maps the input data, this, this image, into like an output data that we want to put them in like two classes. Okay. So we can use these deep learning. It, it goes through these complicated functions, sequence simpler functions that, that the network learns all at once. So these are the convolutional layers. It takes a 2B convolutions over the map of input values. Okay, but the important part is it has some low spatial structure. So just like we look at it, the image has some spatial structure. Okay, so what do we need? So the real, the real catch for doing any of these deep learning projects is you have to have this huge data set before you can even start. Right? So this is like the catch 22. You don't know if it's going to work until like you've, after you've done the entire experiment, right? Okay. So, you know, so we've got data sets now that are actually hundreds of thousands of images. I'll show in this next slide or coming up that like on that same phenotype where we actually mounted multiple cameras and you can drive through the field and take images of the field. So we did this over two years, 2016, 2017. We have the same GPS, so we can, we can assign those images to individual field plots. So we know every field plot that each image was taken from. And then we can go out and score for traits of interest, right? And then assign those scores to the images that were taken on that day from that plot, okay? So this is why we call them breeder trained data sets, okay? And then we can use like some weighted classification. We can classify them as percentages or we can classify the images into some categories. Uh, is how these ways work. And then we penalize them by how far the way the labels are, like the labels that we gave them to, um, that the network gave them to the, to the ground truth, right? Meaning like the labels that we visually scored the field plots. Okay, so that's the idea. So, so the real catch, here, like, so if you didn't catch that, the real catch here is that before you know if this experiment's gonna work, you've actually invested like multiple years of graduate students and postdocs and and just to get the data set to see if, if you can train these neural networks, okay? So here's some of our field trials that we've been doing this. These are just one of our research farms uh, uh, close to Kansas State. We did this in two years. Most of our imaging, these are winter wheat, so we plant them in October, we harvest them in June. You know, we, we image them through heading development and through grain filling. So that's in April and May. We have about two months there where we do phenotyping. And then the germplasm we did this on, we had an association panel. This is 300-some uh, lines. This is just winter wheat varieties. These are well adapted. These are all elite type materials. We don't have any wild looking material in any of these things. And so these are winter wheat varieties. Important to note, about 5% of these were onless types. So if you're not familiar with wheat morphology, you can have on, which are the little uh, spikes that come out of the wheat, or you can have uh, onless, which is like a naked, uh, type type uh, wheat head. And then we had a, a recombinant in red line population, uh, Lincoln bifolar. These are two varieties. So this is a pretty 
elite, well-adapted uh, set of germplasm. Okay, so here's what our phenotyper looks like from an aerial picture. We've got like a little canopy over there to make a little bit of shading. It makes the imaging a little more uniform. Same thing, you can see the GPS units on top of that thing. So each image has a geo position within, within a plot. And then we have some camera set up where we have different cameras just passing about uh, less than half a meter over the field plot and then taking, taking a really proximal image uh, of those field plots. And so this is, this is kind of what that data collection looks like. And, and not to underestimate, you know, the amount of time and complexity that went into like just getting the data sets. So here's the first, com like I said, complex trait in wheat. It's not actually complex because it's like a single gene controlled trait, but it's complex in the sense of like the morphology. Okay, so here's a picture of some onless types. You see that there's no beards on here and you see these long uh, beards coming out of the wheat head here, right? So we have a few thousand pictures that are onless and then, you know, a few thousand more that are on here. And so this is the kind of, this is what, uh, the training data set looks like. You know, we have thousands and thousands of, of pictures uh, that look like these two sets here. So we make this thing, we call it WheatNet, I guess now. So this is for scoring on. So we started out with this as a really simple uh, trait in the sense of it's just got two classes and we can say yes or no, it's on or onless. Okay. So we have about 700 plots. This was two replications of those 300 entries. Uh, 29 of those are onless. Okay. So we must have had one plot die out. It should have been 30. But, um, so then we, we separate these into a training and a validation and a testing set. And remember, we did this across two years. So we trained it on one year, and then we validated it on a like, totally separate field experiment uh, from the other year. So we trained it. Uh, so what we do is we pick out several thousand images that are on, several thousand equal number of images that are on this, and then uh, you train these uh, accordingly. So then you validate them. So the important part is you train it. You tune, the, you tune the model to optimize on the validation set. And then to be fair, you have to do the testing on a totally independent data set that didn't go into any way into your model building. Okay, so this is what these guys, um, our computer science guys call these a confusion matrix. I don't really know why, but anyway, this is, the, this is basically the proportion, you know, here in, it's like a heat map. Here in, in the white is like, um, is, is one to one so that, that here's the observed and here's the predicted, right? So we hit like extremely high accuracy, 99 plus percent accuracy on the training set, the validation set, and the testing set, okay? So what that looked like then in, in the image numbers then is, 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 um, is, is because these images can only be fed into the network in small 250 by 250, sized images, you can't take like an 18 megapixel image just computationally. So it's 250 by 250. So we actually have 10 image crops that come out of each image. And so that's the accuracy on those image, like the cropped out images. And then when we take a consensus from all of the crops that come up from a single image, uh, then we actually hit up to 100% accuracy. And then remember also that we have multiple images from each plot. And so on a plot level basis, we can, we can hit 100% accuracy for scoring on versus onless, okay? So like that's pretty awesome, but um, you, you know, you could walk through the field in 30 minutes and score this also. So, <laughs> so we spent three years building a phenotyper and uh, you know, full-time postdoc and a computer graduate student and you know, several million CPU hours, uh, but we can score on versus onless, okay. So now let's go to something a little more interesting, a little more complex. This is growth stages in wheat. That's, you have to trust me, that's what it says up there. Um, and so if you look at wheat development here, you go through these stages where we're in tillering stage here, then uh, you're in uh, stem elongation here, these, the nodes are coming out here. And then this is the important stage right here where the head is coming out of the boot. So you know, in, in a wheat grass, the head emerges out of the boot from that, from that flag leaf. And this is a real critical stage, obviously, right? That's when, um, that's when flowering is happening. That determines the overall morphology, um, the, the timing of that flowering. So, and then this is the critical grain flowing period. So these are traditionally scored as when 50% of the tillers have headed out of the boot. So this, you know, like, so visually, this is really easy to score. You just look at the plot, you take a mental assessment of how many tillers are out there, 
and then you take a mental assessment of how many of those are 50% out, okay? But actually, like, when you think about what actually just happened in a split second in your own neural network, that's, like, actually extremely complicated because you had to take some visual assessment, not just of, like, how many are out, but of, like, the total density of those also, okay? So obviously, it's a really phys important physiological trait. So, like, for example, in Kansas, you can't be too early or you'll get winter kill. And you don't want to be too late because then you'll be into the heat stress of the hot summers. Okay, so this is really critical breeder selection. Um, and so why, why was this something we want to go after for HTP? One is like a time series measurement. So it's recorded as a date. So you actually have to go out multiple time points during the season uh, to accurately measure this, right? So it requires going through all the plots uh, each day or at least every other day, something like that. Okay, so here's what, here's what some of our image sets look like. So we actually do this now in time series, okay? So if you take a plot early on, it'll be all leafy like this. You don't see any heads out. You see one here just starting to come out of the boot, right? So this might be like, you know, somewhere between 1% to 5% headed, right? And here's another one that's almost completely headed out. Uh, sorry, it's a little dark to see maybe from the back, but you can see that all the heads are out here now. You might have one or two real late ones. And this is about 90% uh, headed out here. So what we do now is we go through the field uh, each day. We take a visual score. We run the phenotype at the same time. And then we can, we can take 10,000 images in a day. And by going through the field once, we can assign a value to every one of those uh, 10,000 images. And then we do that at multiple time points through the season. So then you get an iPhotos library that looks something like this, where you, you, know, you filled up your library with 100,000 pictures. And, Every one of them is like 10% headed or 90% headed or 60%, something like this. And so we have a huge training data set now where we have all of these images and they're tagged with like a breeder trained uh, type of score. So this is training wheat net for heading here. Right, so our training sets, so, so here's where we go back and we have two different populations. So we have one population, it's a diversity panel. It's got a much bigger morphology. And then we apply this to the biparental population that's much more narrow in its morphology. Okay, so uh, the training set here, we had this Lake and Fuller biparental population in 2016. We had two years of the association panel. And then we, we, we balanced this out with about 2,000 images per maturity level. So, so in 10% 10, 10 increments from zero to 100. And so that was a total of around 20,000 uh, training images and 200,000 um, patches from those images. So each one of those patches actually counts as like an individual training data point, okay? So in the validation set was the same thing, 100 plots from this diversity panel. And this is the part that I don't really know, but if, if you're deep into neural networks, then, then here's all the gory details on this. So you, you have to, because, because of memory, memory limitations, you have to feed these in in small batches. So you can't actually, you can't actually put like 200,000 images in at the same time. And then we, then we have to tune the parameters for how, how fast the, is the learning rate and then how many FX it's trained and then the total number of training there. So this was all optimized. And it turns out interesting that the really crazy part to me is that these networks are pre-trained on like just random images from the internet. And then we just train the last few layers on the wheat data. Um, and then interestingly, like these networks that we train for like the on versus on this, versus the percentage heading, they, it was like only like the last one or two layers that were trained differently, okay? So what this looked like then in the field is that if we go out over time series, so say right here we have plot number one, plot number two, down to plot number n. If we go through the field and we image those day by day, and we also take a visual score, then we have a time series imaging where we can assign uh, an image value and a percentage scoring to that, right? So we can train the neural network on these. And then to do this in high throughput, we can just go measure new plots um, and just have the images. And then using the neural network, we can actually assign the percentages to each day, right? And then we just need to find the intersection of when it goes above 50%. And that would be the classical measure of heading data. Okay. So this is what it looks like then. So we do a time series imaging, and then we fit this percent heading uh, model here, where we fit a logistic regression onto those time series uh, measurements. 
And so this is what some real data looks like. These are actually visual scores. And then I'll show you the neural network scores in a minute here. So this would be uh, a field plot. Uh, this is our plot identifier, plot number uh, 20014, uh, where it was scored on, on day 110 as zero. The next time point, it would have been scored at 20, 40, 50, 80, and then the rest of the time points were scored at 100. So we fit this logistic regression on here. Uh, this is just a classical logistic regression uh, equation. We, we take and we, we fix phi one uh, here at 100% so that you know, all the wheat plots have to end up at 100% headed out. Um, we, we actually put some dummy variables at zero and 100, which were past our measurement days just to help fit the regression. And then phi two and phi three here are actually the slope and, and then the intercept, you know, way down here, the, the slope of that, of that curve here. So we fix phi one, phi one and 100. We find, then we just simply find the date at with which that, which that logistic regression intersects the 50% point, right? So we find 50% here, we find that date, and then, you know, this one is around day 118, right? And we'd, we'd assign that as the heading date. The cool thing here that I'll come back to is that because we have the slope of how quickly it goes from zero to 100, we can actually measure the rate of, of heading date. And so this would be a really interesting trait that you might think about. You know, in some cases you want really rapid heading so that everything uniformly heads at the same time. If you're in like a risky environment where you might like get late freeze or early, early stress, you might want to stretch out a heading date. So this is a cool new breeding target that we've been thinking about now that you can actually like measure and then presumably breed uh, for the rate of heading. And so what we do then is we, is we do that exact same thing with the neural network. And so remember now, the visual scores are we go out here and we, we take visual measurements. The neural network here is we actually image the plots. We train the neural network and we assign a value for the image on each one of those days. So the purple dots here are scores from the neural network based on imaging. And then we fit that same logistic regression. We find from the neural network scores, right, based on that logistic regression, the heading date, and, um, and then we can basically fully automated measure the progression of heading and then find the date in which it hits that classical measure of 50% heading. Uh, so this is, this is overall how we do it, right? This is the example of that same plot. Um, of course, I show you the best example where they like match up perfectly, right? Um, so yeah, some of them are really good. Here's another great example where we hit, you know, basically hit it right on the same day. Some of them are not so good. You know, you have some overestimation um, in the neural network here from what the visual scores were at. Um, and so that slope kind of gets panned out and then, you're, then you miss it by about a day. So basically now what we've done is we've high throughput measured uh, through all of those plots, we have a time series measurement about 10, 10 or 11 time points where we've imaged um, dozens of images for each plot. And then we just apply individually this, this regression across all of those plots. Uh, so that's what this looks like then here. So this would be, um, the, on, on this axis here is all of the time points that we took visual measurements. You can see that those are nicely spaced out on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday across the growing season. Okay, and so here's where we took visual, visual measurements, and then this would be that 50% estimate from the visual measurements. On this axis here is that for each individual plot, we fit that logistic regression based on the neural network scores, and, and then intersected that and got the same heading date uh, for that. And you can see here, these are the time points. We tried to do this every, every other day, so this, you know, this big gap here is like one of the caveats of when it starts raining in the field. You can't like drive your tractor through it anymore. So we had a, we had a pretty big gap in here where we weren't able to image uh, the field. And so overall though, man, we, we, uh, we had a big range in heading in this particular population, um, but we had a really strong correlation. You can see that here, there's a nice one-to-one -one trend. Uh, the, the, the red line is the fit, and then the black line is the one-to-one -one, uh, line on there. And so we had a really strong correlation a mean absolute error of less than one day and a root mean square error of just a day and a quarter. So overall, uh, I think we get, you know, I think we're hitting within the tolerance of what you can actually visually uh, score also. We did have, you can see kind of here, we had a little bias uh, right in this region. I think, I'm not real sure, but my, my working hypothesis is that 
that's because we had good imaging here and then we had this kind of gap in our imaging time points. And so I think those curves got pushed up a little high. And so we early, we estimated the heading dates in this range um, a, little, a little earlier than they should have been. Uh, but overall, we can, for, compared to the visual measurements with the neural network, we can get 57% of the plots within one day of the visual estimate, and we can get 88% of those within, within two days of what they were visually scored. So here's the distribution of those, of the overall heading date. So this is the day of the year where we estimated the heading date, and this is the frequency for that population. Here's the Lincoln and Fuller, the parents of that, of that biparental population, and the difference between the visual and the neural network. The visual here is in the dark, and then the filled, the filled background here. And so you can see for the parents, we were really accurate on those. You can see that little shift in the distribution here. Uh, between where we were in this, you know, in this 115 day range, we were about a day or two early on those. Um, but overall, we can match the distribution. We can get a really accurate assessment um, over there. So if you're an astute graduate student, though, you're saying, ah, oh, there's something really funky with this distribution, that that doesn't look like a normal distribution. Okay, we'll come back to that. That's, that's good. Okay, so the other thing you can't see up here, but this says phi three up there. And so this is actually the slope of of those curves on there and so here's where i think we you know we had some some a little bit of bias uh with the neural network and the imaging set is where in this distribution here we're measuring the slope of heading you know the rate of heading using the neural network versus the rate of heading for um for the visual scores and overall the um uh, you know the the slope of the curve estimated for the neural networks were steeper uh, than for the visual scores. And this, this is, in my mind, I think this is due to just getting uniform timing of, of the imaging data sets. Okay, overall, I should say though too, the heritability on, on the actual measurement of the heading day of Brodson's heritability was around uh, 0 0.92 for the actual heading date. And then surprisingly, we had, we had good heritability for both the visual and the neural network the slope around 0.5, So I was surprised that we actually had heritable measures of, of the rate of heading based on this approach. <clears throat> so overall now we can like start to look at this in depth. So here's just an example. This is comparing the phi three. So remember this is the slope. This is the rate of heading compared to the heading date. So you might say, oh, you know, the, the, the rate of heading is just determined by when you're actually heading. But what we can see here is that there's a slight negative correlation, but it's actually really weak. So interestingly, you know, you can pick stuff here that's like got a really rapid heading versus a really slow heading, but they're actually end up heading at the 50% point, they end up heading on the same day. And so this might be really interesting objectives if you ever wanted to like pick something that's early, but it actually has a long duration of heading. <clears throat> so we did just some simple genetic mapping. We have, we have GBS on this population, about 14,000 markers. So we tested this for days to heading. And for that slope, we just finished a simple linear regression here where we're estimating the effect of each one of those markers. <clears throat> um, so here's, here's a classic Manhattan plot. This is for, it says up here, days to heading. So this is the um, association testing for days to heading. Uh, here we got two really strong associations. These are actually for known photo period sensitive uh, alleles that are segregating in the breeding material, so PPD B1 and D1. Uh, so those are real nice associations here. There's another um, association strong that found on, on 1B. Uh, we haven't quite figured out what that is, and then maybe another one here on 3B. And then a few on the unanchored markers, but these are actually, turns out that they're actually should be anchored on, on 2B. So overall, you can't really see it because they line directly up on top of each other, but we did this for the visual assessments and the neural network. And we can, you can see a square right here and a circle right here. So it's, it's cool. We can actually now map, genetically map, uh, a trait that was fully scored using the automated uh, imaging and the neural network. <laughs> so that's the Manhattan plot. This is more of a Manhattan, Kansas plot uh, because it's a little flatter. This is for phi three. And, um, and so same thing. So even though we had a nice heritability trait, 0.4, uh, we didn't find much 
for any uh, genetic association on those ones. We maybe have something here on 2B, but um, we have to use genomic prediction models because uh, apparently there's not any major control of, even though it's heritable, it doesn't look like there's any major, uh, major genetic control of, of the, uh, the, the rate of heading. Okay, so this goes back to the question all those graduate students were wondering about, like, like you, get a, you get a distribution like this, you gotta say, oh, there's like some epistasis or something going on, right? If you can't explain it, it's epistasis, okay? So, um, so we took this, we just fit a two-way interaction model for all the significant markers, so right? So it's marker one by marker two, and then the interaction of those two markers. Cool though, if you take this distribution and you chop it off right here at the inflection point, <clears throat> You run a chi-square of a three to one on that guy, and it, uh, it, fits, it fits really nicely with a three to one ratio, which would be like a two gene uh, dominance type epistatic model. And so this was a nice working hypothesis. We said, ah, oh, yeah, I bet there's some nice epistatic interactions between those two. And so that's what I'm showing here. Um, this is just our first attempt to visualize this, so I'm not real sure, but here's, here's that same, um, um, association plot, you know, we have that strong peak on, on 2B and 2D for the, for the two PPD1 alleles. Uh, interestingly, like here's the allele effect. So one of them was coming from parent one, uh, Lincoln, and the other one was coming from parent two, Fuller, right? So they, so individually as varieties, they hit the right maturity, right? But their progeny get like thrown all over the place, okay? So, so, and I talked with Alan, he said, yeah, for sure, you know, we can only have one of these in the breeding material. If you put them both, they're too early. You, you have neither one, then they're way too late. And sure enough, right, we got, we got some, these are just the size of these circles or the significance of interaction. So this, there's, there's some interaction here with this, this one allele, but then there's really strong at interaction between the 2B and the 2D allele there. So we have some classic kind of epistatic interactions. This is just uh, the significance testing of all those pairwise combinations across the genome. Um, so here's like the classic, interaction plot, this because like, this is my favorite plot, right? Directly out of Falconer. I mean, yeah. So, uh, so here we got like the PPD1 allele and the, and the PPDB1 allele, right? And then depending on which allele state you have for each one of these, if you have both of the non-sensitive alleles, you're really early, around 115, 116 days. If you add one of them, you add about two days. If you add the other one, you add about you know, four days. And then if you stack them both up though, you add in like 14, 14 days of the heading diet. So uh, just beautiful classic example of, of these two alleles interacting. And this, and just like I said again, this is like our optimal maturity range. Uh, this, is, this is day of the year, sorry, but this is the optimal, optimal range for wheat in Kansas. This is pretty early. You're risking like uh, a lot of cold damage and and frost damage, and then this is just way too late. You're gonna have a lot of heat stress in that range. So the optimal varieties are, are picking one or other of those alleles, even though they're both floating around the breeding program. <clears throat> so the final thing then is just to say, you know, like we, we drove this with our tractor, um, you know, to give you an honest assessment of it, it takes about, so, so we were running through uh, both populations, which was, just, was around like uh, 14, 14, 1,200, 1,300 field plots. And that would take like a good four to five hours, okay? So is it high throughput? Not really. You can go through visually about the same amount of time. Okay, but uh, you know, doing this with a UAV is really scalable though actually. And so here I'm just, you know, we don't have any like good results from this, but this is just to like pretend like we can do it, okay? <laughs> So, so this is like you using like a really high resolution camera from a UAV um, and actually flying over these plots using video. So you're actually taking really high frame rate. And we can, we can cover those plots at two plots per second. So we can actually cover those same thousand plots in about a 25 minute flight. Okay, so now we've actually gone high throughput. Okay, and here just to say that it's doable or theoretically, right? Here again, we don't know if it's doable until we actually like do the experiment for two years and get the big data set and stuff. But here, like here's an example of images from there. If you zoom in on that middle of that plot right here, you can see these are headed out and these are still leafy before they're headed out. So we can actually get like sub millimeter pixel resolution of these same plots 
using a UAV and actually covering them at you know a thousand plots in, in 20 minutes. So this is like where we're really focused on now, taking the same approach using the UAV extracted data um, to see if if we can we can do this in a truly high throughput uh, type of approach. Okay, so then the real question I'm sure you've all been wondering now is do we still need breeders? Okay, so now we've got uh, genomic selection models that can predict, you know, which ones are the best. Uh, we've got like neural networks that can actually do the phenotyping to get the data that goes in to the uh, models. So once the breeders have trained all the neural networks, what do we do here now? Uh, so we tested the same thing on a real neural network. Okay, this network was two years and 11 months old at the time of testing. We had one training epoch, which was about two minutes. That's all the attention span we had. And then we had a sample size of 16 spikes. Um, eight of them were on and eight were onless. And then for this uh, project, we coded them as spiky and not spiky, uh, meaning like they were on or onless. This was to simplify, you know, for the neural network, we coded them as zero and one on and onless. So here we coded them as spiky and not spiky. So. Here's my daughter, Talia Marie, and uh, let's see if she can demonstrate this neural network. This one, this, this one, yes. no. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So the neural network. Um, this one, yes. this one, yes. no. <laughs> So in about two minutes, you can train a real neural network to do what <laughs> it took us several years and 100,000 images uh, to do. So there's our conclusion. So um, the, the high throughput phenotyping, we're really getting into production mode, I think, over this last year, two years. And then we're integrating that into the prediction modeling to where we're building uh, models that have like a vegetation index assessment along with the genomic data. And those are actually giving a drastic input. Okay, I, I just briefly touched on that in the beginning. Uh, the exciting part is we can measure some complex traits uh, using deep learning. And so in, in my mind, this is really exciting new frontiers because theoretically we can extend those, we can extend that model training to like any trait that we score, right? All that goes into it is a whole bunch of pictures, images that we collected high throughput in the field. And then whatever the breeder, whatever you go out and visually score, right? theoretically can, you know, we can build a neural network to score that same trait, right? So then it kind of opens up like uh, limitless opportunities. So we know that breeders are still relevant, Mark, at least for now. Thank you. Um, and right, because somebody's got to like, you know, assimilate all this information and then figure out what to do with it, or at least to ask some graduate students to do something with it. And then uh, remember everything you need to know you learned at Cornell while you were here. So. Okay, so thanks. Um, huge thanks to all of our, uh, everybody in my group. Uh, Byron Evers is, is, is our uh, main technician that manages all the field trials. Mark Lucas, I've mentioned this a few times to graduate students, but Mark's really critical in our group. He's a, a data scientist, basically. Spends all of his time moving big data around. Um, Dalji is one of the graduate students. And then Kevin, uh, uh, Yu Wang is a uh, postdoc who was really instrumental in building the actual phenotyper that, that you know, took us several years to collect these data sets. And then Rich Brown is our, our new UAV pilot. And Atina is another postdoc on the group who's, who's uh, really helped us work through the high throughput phenotyping data. The, our computer science collaborators, which obviously like, you know, did a substantial work on this project, is Robert Pless's group at George Washington and then Hong Wang is a, a graduate student on the project. And this was primarily supported through a National Science Foundation um, plant genome research program. So that's all I've got. I'd be glad to take any questions. Mark. I'm greatly relieved that breeders are still relevant. Uh, <laughs> but I, how small? Uh, 
of a plot can you image? Can you do a single one meter row? We haven't tried single rows, right? So the next frontier, right? So, th so these are, these are full-size plots. And the trick is, um, especially with the UAV, the trick is, because we're, we're working on this now, the trick is we crop out the outside, right? So we, we don't want like confounding effects of like the neighboring plot. Yeah. And so to have single, so, you know, to go down to single rows or even better, like single plants, where you have confounding effects of like stuff that's like definitely wrong, like something else overlapping, we haven't even tried to touch that yet. So, I mean, that's like the real frontier, but yeah, so we need to do it on head rows and then we'd really be high through. Yeah. yeah. What's your next trade? Oh, yeah, good question. So we've actually on the same data set, we've got barley yellow dwarf scores, which is like sort of a combination of like yellowing plus um, like some anthocyanin and purpling. Um, so we're going to we're going to try that. Really, my next trait is to like do this exact same thing, just using the UAV data. Yeah, but that the trouble is like there's a huge amount of pre-processing and like just to get to the point where we have like images that can go into the neural network. Yeah. And also, this is single color. Uh, did you play around with different filters um, on the, uh, the? Yeah. So, um, so all of our imaging has just been with like like off the shelf RGB cameras. Like I didn't I didn't mention, but the UAV for like the vegetation index, we fly like multispectral cameras. The trouble is the resolution on those cameras is much much lower. So there's really a balance between. I think what goes into the neural networks, uh, the RGB images work really good, and the. And more importantly, they're much higher resolution than what we get from like the multi-spectral cameras. Yeah. Ed, Ed. Uh, you were talking about the use of progression for going uh, flowers and then, but I wonder if you thought about just trying to show all 10 pictures through the growing season and pick out when, yeah, which time point it takes uh, yeah. after that. And, and if it was off, you know, when we yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just give it a date and then give it the images and tell you. To, yeah, yeah. So, um, so we're just like, that's kind of like, I don't, and here again, I don't really understand it, but um, that's kind of like the frontier of, of deep learning as far as what these guys tell me, because there you're actually putting like two levels of predictors in, right? So you have a structured data set where it's images, but you have to tell the network what order and what time the images are from and then give it a classifier. Right? So the only thing that's going into these, this training set is a bunch of images and a bunch of classifications, right? It, it can't even think on like, you know, a next higher level. So, but I agree that with these data sets, you can conceptualize like much smarter ways to, or much more informed ways to train them that, you know, take into account the spatial and the temporal relationship. Yeah, sure. Um. So it's hard to do better than you know the human annotation because obviously a, a lot of traits have seen someone measure it so well. Yeah. And the theoretical from the that you, you know your loss function is how yeah. close are you to humans, but if humans aren't perfect, I mean, are there ways to besides just having five people score the same thing? Are there ways to get around that for a little bit? No, and I mean, Mike can attest to this too. I think right that our upper limit is like however good you score the trait. Right? And so usually, I didn't mention it here, but like we, we can build like digital elevation models to measure plant height across the whole breeding nurseries. And you can actually, and then we benchmark that against how, you know, you go out with a, a ruler and measure them. You're like, oh, there's got to be minimal bias in that. But we can actually hit heritabilities and accuracies that are better than human measurements. And then we try and benchmark them against the human measurements. And so it's like a catch-22, right? To say, well, um, you know, our ground truth is not accurate, but we're trying to get more accurate than our ground truth. So, but I think, I think though, like, you know, if we can scale this out to many, many, many breeding programs and, you know, then like every, you know, like multiple scores, I think then you kind of have the, um, you know, the logic of the, of the masses kind of thing where it should even out over a big enough data set, theoretically. Uh, yeah, just uh, coming from a practical point of view. And you, you, you make a very good uh, demonstration of all these uh, training populations to start out the What about uh, you, uh, you change the, the environment? So you have a um, hot winter and uh, change the population. Is it 
situation would be a, a common kind of molecule. Yeah. Similarly, when you change the nitrogen, you feel more nitrogen and the change in the and also the population is not present from the cause of bacteria. So in this means, you need a, in each situation you need a changing population, <coughs> or you can develop a changing population based on you can apply the different. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there's two answers to that. One, like I think if we do it across enough years and enough different breeders and programs, then you kind of see all of the variants that are, you know, um, morphological variants that are out there. The other one is though that there's opportunities to like actually train this in season, like, right? So you could actually take data visually on a small number of plots and then in season train these type of things on to like 50,000 plots that you don't have the physical capacity to score. And that's especially the way we're thinking about it for just the vegetation index, right? We'll build the model, we'll actually measure yield on like 1,000 plots and then use that information to predict yield in the same environment to like 50,000. Yeah. So I was a little bit close to what you're talking about. So I'm thinking about your history scores. How do you understand that? Yeah, so. Yeah, so this scoring was all done by Byron, right? So we just have one score, right? So this is just benchmarked across. So we don't really have the confounding effects of multiple people being biased. Yeah, but I mean, on the same token, we might try to get the picture set up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the same person, there's, there's really minimal um, internal, yeah. what is that, internal bias? How's that mean? So like, like, I mean, we had very few time points where it was like you go out one day and then you go out the next day and you actually score it lower than you did the time before, right? So, so we're, we're really not. Yeah. So, we, yeah, that's within one person, it's pretty minimal. To follow up on Tia's question, when you showed the curves, when you showed like the curve, the heading days, comparing the visual score to the CNM score, and there was a discrepancy in the second one that you showed. How confident are you that it's a CNN that's wrong or the person that's wrong? So yeah, same thing again. We, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know which one's wrong. I need to go back and probably run those models again and see which one has like a, a better fit on, you know, like a, a, a smaller error on fitting those maybe. But yeah, here again, like how do you know what's right? I don't know. You took the images from a certain time point where there's a discrepancy and you actually took the image and counted the number of heads and counted the number of bonds. Oh man, that's too much work. <laughs> but, well, they had the same heritability. Yeah. I agree. I agree with that. That's much easier way to like just see which has higher heritability. They were the same. So. Yeah. Did you try to correlate the visual scores? You mean for like heading date? Uh, or for the no, we haven't looked at that yet. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, there should be some spec. Well, I mean, there, well, we know for sure that there's a spectral difference between before they're headed and after they're headed. Whether you can actually get like some percentage that would be accurate enough to score a date during that progression. Yeah, we don't know. The other trouble is we don't. We don't fly the hyperspectral, but like once a week. Yeah. But that's a good idea. We should, we should, we should try it. So in, in figuring out the heritability, there's, there's an error from scoring and there's an error from, you know, some plots head out earlier because they're a little drier and some head out, head out later. So could you feed the deviation of, of the, the actual heading from the expected for the genotype? into a, a CNN and, and, and so that it would try to predict whether, okay, it's heading on this date, but I think this is probably early relative to what the genotype would yeah. normally do. Like put some genetic information into the, is that what yeah, you're saying? Or, or ultimately get it to try to predict the, that other component of error. Which could do it, but it's just, you know, it's yeah, that would be a little biased though. In, in the breeding program, yeah. Within the breeding program though, you don't really have those major effects still segregating, right? But um, I mean, that's, 
if I'm understanding your question right, that's like along the lines of what we're thinking on is actually putting, would you be even, okay, so here's our, here's our sci-fi idea is to actually. Predict some microenvironmental effects, not, not genetic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, maybe we actually got some fun new spatial models that actually like, they're like auto regressive models, except because we map these things in physical coordinates, we apply like an actual physical correction. Those actually perform really well. So I would say maybe that's an easier way than doing it through the neural net. But yeah, I, I know what you're saying, like somehow feed into the neural network that these two plots are next to each other versus these two are like clear across the field. Okay, I'm gonna take one more question. Are there any questions from Geneva? This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.